Welcome everybody to our sixth Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health Seminar. As usual, please post any questions that you have in the chat box below, or alternatively, you can add your questions to the Google Doc and you can find that linked under the YouTube video. So this week, we are delighted to welcome Professor Sir Richard Pito. Richard is an Emeritus Professor of Medical Statistics and Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. So Richard's work has included studies of the causes of cancer in general and of the effects of smoking in particular, and the establishment of large-scale randomised trials of, the, of treatment of cancer and various other diseases. He was made a Fellow of the Royal Society of London in 1989 for introducing meta-analyses of randomised trials and was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1999 for services to epidemiology. In 2011, he was awarded the BMJ Lifetime Achievement Award. His work continues to have a direct influence on public policy and adult mortality in many countries. So we are delighted to host him today and Richard will be giving his talk, Halving Premature Death. So if you'd like to start sharing your screen, Richard. Okay. Okay, is that visible? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Well, look, we're all going to die, but the question is, at what age do we die? I want to talk about the prospects of halving premature death, and I'll define this arbitrarily as death before age 70. I like this definition because it means I'm completely safe. Um, and a lot of the slides, the slides will be available afterwards. Um, the department will have them available if anybody wants them, or I can, I can provide them. And on the slides, there are references to the claims I make. And there's a one page article in Science, 600 words, where, which summarizes everything I'm going to say in the next 60 minutes. So, um, primitive death, if you want to avoid death before 70, You've got to do three things. You've got to not die before 70. You've got to not die in childhood, not die in early adult life, and not die in middle age. And the causes of death in childhood, in early adult life, and in middle age are really very different. And so we need to look separately at these. But first, before I get onto this, I want to just think how many deaths are we talking about worldwide? And what sort of risks of death are we talking about worldwide? So these are the crude numbers. I'll give numbers here for 2010. What I'm going to do, I'm on the whole talking about numbers of deaths in 2010. Things are a bit better now in 2020, except for COVID. But overall, um, death rates have been coming down, but they're not so different from 2010. And I want to look at the past and the present. I want to look at the trends in mortality up till 2010. I'll start with trends just in England. Well, actually, yeah, it's England. I'd even start with English males rather than um, rather than English humans, um, because English males are more interesting because they smoke out so much that we had the worst death rates in the world from smoking back in 1970. So I want to look at trends in mortality in England as representative of a rich country with a lot of tobacco deaths, but then. We've actually had for the last 40 years, or from actually the last, ever since 1970, so 1970 to 2010 or 2015, we've had reasonably good international data on trends in mortality in pretty well all the country, all the major countries of the world. So I want to get a global perspective on the trends in mortality over the last, since 1970. So let's look at different countries. Um, but before I do that, how many deaths are we talking about? Well, just in terms of millions, in 2010, there were about 53 million deaths in 2010. Um, we don't know the exact number, they're not all counted, but something like that. And this would include about 30 million before age 70. And that would be 7 million at ages 0 to 4. That number's gone down. 5 million at ages five to 34, um, and that number has also fallen. And then 18 million at ages 35 to 69. Now this number is increasing, but it's increasing not because the death rates are going up, but because the population is going up. The death rates, as we'll see, are going down in each of these age groups, except where something special is going on, like having a war or a COVID epidemic. 
So we're, we're looking at mortality rates that are falling, but we've got at present 30 million deaths a year before age 70. And just by coincidence, that number's probably going to stay fairly constant through 2010, 2020, 2030, because the decrease in mortality, the decrease in the death rates among people of a given age has been counterbalanced by the increasing number of people who are getting, particularly they're getting to middle age when death rates are higher than they are in early adult life. And also the number of people reaching old age, but let's just, let's just stick to death before 70, halving premature death. This is Richard Doll's slogan, and he wrote it in the foreword to a book I was writing on tobacco deaths about 25 years ago. And I've liked it so much that I've been using it ever since, and we've actually engraved it in stone on the departmental wall. Death in old age is inevitable, but death before old age is not. Now, as I say, if we want to avoid death before old age, we've got to consider separately three age ranges in which the main causes of premature death differ. I'd like to say childhood, but there's been so much emphasis over the last half century or more on under five mortality. So I'll just stick to ages naught to five. Not very many people die at ages five to 14. So it doesn't really matter whether we make the cut point at age five or 10 or 15, but I'll take naught to five because under five mortality has been so widely discussed and widely studied. And then I'll take something like early adult life, five to 34, or possibly five to 40, five to 50, it doesn't matter. And then I want to consider middle age. Um, you can define middle age how you like. I mean, in here I've defined as 35 to 69. In other places, I'll take it as 50 to 69. It doesn't really matter. I want to get to an age when most of the deaths are actually from non-communicable diseases like heart disease, cancer, chronic obstructive lung disease, and so on. So these are the three age ranges I'll be considering. And I want to say, can mortality be halved in each range? And I think the answer is yes, but by very different means. Okay, let's start with the mortality trends in England in 1910, 1960, and 2010. And I'll say this is actually going to be English males to start with. I'll do the females later. And I want you to note the risks at age five, the risk by age five, the risk by age 70. So we'll start off in 1910. My mother was born in 1909, so it's within my mother's lifetime anyway. Um, and here's this red line here is age five. And you can see that actually about one in six of the kids born in 1910 would have died before their fifth birthday. By 1960, it was still about 4%. Now it's more like about 0.4%. So there's, there's been this huge decrease in under five mortality. And in the world as a whole, in, 19, in, in 2010, it was about 5%. And by 2020, it's down to about 4%. So you know that what's true of Britain in 1960 was tr is true of the world as a whole now in terms of under five mortality. Obviously not if you're in the middle of some terrible sort of catastrophe like a famine or you know, a war or something, but just taking the world as a whole. It's an enormous change. Okay, so under, under five mortality, 16%, 4%, less than 1%. And then death before 70. Well, about one third was still alive at 70. Two thirds had died before 70. In 19, at 1910 death rates. And this is at the death rates of 1910, when the people who were actually born in 1910, okay, by the time you get to the end of the 20th century, they'll be 80 or 90, but they'll have late 20th century medicines. So they'll have lower death rates. But this is looking at the death rates. If you took the death rates of 1910 and just strung them together at the death rates of 1910, the childhood death rates, the adult death rates, the death rates in old age of 1910, how many would survive to various different ages? And at those death rates, only one third would survive to age 70. By 2010, we're at the point where 21% would have died before, 79% would, would still be alive at age 70 at the death rates of 2010. And this is males, females are doing somewhat better. 16% 16, 16 dead. So overall, it'd be about 18% dead 
um, if you take males and females together um, at current death rates, at 2010 death rates. Okay, and this, at 1910 death rates, you can see there's quite a lot of mortality in later childhood, in early adult life, and so on, and then it gets steeper and steeper. So it's, you know, the death rates really were considerably higher in each age group, and almost nobody at 1910 death rates would have got past the age of 90. There's been this huge decrease in mortality. It doesn't mean we're going to get huge numbers living beyond the age of 100, but it does mean we're going to have a lot more people living with reasonable quality of life into their 70s, into their 80s. In absolute terms, not so many living in their 90s. Yes, there's a big proportional increase in the number reaching their 90s, but not, um, not a great absolute increase. The absolute increase is in the population among in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, now, so the at some stage, we need to think, is keeping people alive into old age a good idea, not a good idea? And there are both advantages and disadvantages in being old. But I'll come to, I'll come to that later. OK, so we see the big changes from 1910. And if we look just at 1960 versus 2010, well, at earlier ages, the differences aren't so great. I mean, proportionately, we're going from about 4% down to about 0.4%. Um, under five mortality, but we're we'll going from 10% to about 5% dead before age 50. But the, it's later on that you see the difference. And you can see this, you can see it, think of this really as a 10 year shift in age at death. So at each, at each particular proportion still alive, you've got about a 10 year, 10 year shift in the proportion dying before that, in the, in the sorry, in the time, in the time, age at which you reach that proportion. So it's that 10 year shift, but then, you know, get to 100 and everybody's dead by 100. And if you do reach 100, it doesn't matter very much because by then the death rate is 50% per year. So your life expectancy is one year. And at 50% per year mortality, the chances of somebody reaches 100, reaching 110 are about one in a thousand, one in two to the 10. So we're not going to finish up with huge numbers of centenarians as a result of this. Now, the big reason for this, which I'll come back to later, is tobacco deaths. Back in 1960, British males had the worst death rates in the world from tobacco. And between 1960 and 2010, we've had the best decrease in tobacco deaths in the world, where it's easy to have the best decrease if you start off with the worst death rates. But it really is quite striking. Here's, this looks like a packet of cigarettes, but it isn't. Um, it, this, these bars, each of these say, if you've made it to age 35, are you gonna die before age 70? And the shaded is the tobacco deaths and the white is all other deaths. So up at the end, we've got total mortality. So you can see at 1960 death rates, 42% of the men would have been dead before they were 70, and 23 of those 42 deaths would have been tobacco. By 1970, it wasn't much better, because that was 1960. At 1970 rates, it wasn't much better. And then the tobacco deaths start to drop spectacularly, and more as a result of that than as a result of everything else put together. Overall death rates go down spectacularly. So yes, we've had lots of progress in modern medicine, but more than half of the progress of the reduction in the probability of dying before 70 is tobacco deaths. It's quite extraordinary the extent to which that one factor predominates, and still it's about a fifth of all the deaths in this country before age 70, take male and female together. Anyway, by the time the males have got down to these low tobacco death rates, they're pretty well catching up with the females in terms of, I'll call it life expectancy or years lived, you see, there's only about a four year difference now at 2010 death rates between male and female. And it was, there was a much bigger difference between male and female, but that was because the men were dying from smoking and the women on the whole weren't. Now there's approximate equality, still more men that die from smoking than women. Um, but by middle age, there's approximate equality. There's only an old age that that's still true as a sort of leftover of the differences earlier in the century. Okay, now what about the world as a whole? That's, I mean, the first statistic is that 99% of the world is not British if you're a medical statistician. So what about the other 99%? Well, under five mortality, we don't really know what it was in 1950. It would have been approximately a quarter of the kids born in 1950 would have died before their fifth birthday. Nobody really knows, but something like that. By 1970, we're just about getting 
reasonable statistics, on reasonably reliable statistics. It was down to 14% already. And 1990, 9%, 2010, 5%, and 2020, it's down to about 4%, same as Britain in, in, in 1960. So the world as a whole in the second half of the 20th century has done what Britain did in the first half of the 20th century. This big spectacular decrease in child mortality. Yes, millions of kids are still dying, but nowhere near the numbers that were dying at 1950s death rates. And if we look not just at under five mortality, but at the overall pattern, this is the same as those England and Wales curves, except upside down. Um, here, there's the same sort of idea as the England and Wales survival curves, but here we're starting with what proportion of them are dead. 0% dead to start with, and we go up to age 100, by age 100, pretty well 100% are dead. And the thin black line at the top is 1970 death rates. And the thick black line at the bottom is 2010 death rates for the world as a whole. And here you can see in the under five mortality, that 14% versus 5% that we see in the under five mortality, that change of 14% down to 5%. And these little things, I don't know if you can see them, these red stars here. This is England in 1910, and this is England in 2010. So you can compare global progress in the 40 years from 1970 to 2010 versus the progress in England in 100 years from 1910 to 2010. And here for the age 70, the world as a whole, 54% will be dead before 70, and that's gone down to 36%. So it's gone down by 18. So one third fewer, one third lower risk of dying before 70 than would have been the case back at 1970 death rates. And again, here are these red symbols here. There's England in male and female together in um, 1910, and there's England in 2010, 18%. So can we get that 36% for worldwide mortality before 70, down to the 18% that we're seeing in Western Europe, North America? And I think the answer is yes. And you say, can we do it by 2030? I think the answer is no, but I think, can we do it by 2040? Yes, I think that's reasonable hope. Um, it's It's gone down already, actually, since um, since... This, since these numbers, these are the 2010 numbers here. Okay, <clears throat> now obviously the world as a whole is a mixture of rich and poor. It's a mixture of many very, very different countries. The results are not the same in, in all countries. We've got to look separately at different countries. Now the problem is that we've got, you know, 200 different countries. Anyway, let's split them at least into poor countries and rich countries, low income countries and high income countries. But first, let's look at the world as a whole. I want to look at the trends in under five mortality. Then I want to look at the trends in what happens if you're age five, will you die before 50? Then I want to look at the trends in if you're age 50, will you die before 70? So here are those numbers for the world as a whole. Okay, the blue line down the bottom, world as a whole, is the trend in under five mortality actually this goes a bit beyond 2010 it goes to 2015 and that's why we go a bit below the five percent mark there's five percent so you're going down from 14 percent it reached five percent by 2010 and then um sorry five percent by 2010 and then it's down to about four percent now and COVID doesn't affect under five mortality to any appreciable extent then Here's the next one, the red line is the trend in the probability that a five-year-old will die before 50. And it's gone down from 17% down to about seven or eight percent. And that kink on the way down is the effect of the HIV epidemic. It slowed the decline and then as treatment is given to HIV worldwide, it's the world and the mortality catches up. And here's the black line at the top is what's the probability that a 50 year old will die before 70? And again, there's this widespread belief that we've got an epidemic of non-communicable disease. What we've got is an epidemic of getting old enough to die of non-communicable disease. We've got increasing populations in middle age, 
because people haven't died before middle age. But actually, if you say, what's the probability among a fifth, it, uh, among people in middle age, what's the probability of a 50 year old dying before 70? It's gone down spectacularly. It's gone down from, you see here, I think it's about 37% down to about 23%. So it's gone down by just over a third. And that's actually been seen all over the world, rich and poor, except where there are local problems. And I want to look at lots and lots of these things. And in each one, the sort of blob at the end is the 2015 death rate. So the blob at the end is 2015 death rate. And I'm going to use blue for under five mortality, red for five, five to 49, and black for 50 to 69. So let's split the world now into rich and poor. So we've got the World Bank classifies the world as poor countries. That's one sixth of the world's population, low income countries. High-income countries, that's another sixth of the world population. So two-thirds is in the middle, middle-income countries. And that two-thirds is split, one-third lower middle-income, one-third upper middle-income. So it's a sixth, a third, a third, a sixth. And that's how the World Bank classifies poverty in the world. And when you do that, here's the trends in low-income countries. Look at the under-five mortality trends in low-income countries. They're really spectacular. And there you're going down from about 24% down to about 8%. So a threefold reduction in under five mortality. There's the probability that a five-year-old will die before age 50. And here you can see the kink due to the sub-Saharan HIV epidemic. So that and various other things, but that predominantly. And, now, and then you can see the same thing in older people, although most HIV deaths are actually before age 50. So 50 to, 50 to 69. So again, you've got this substantial progress. And in high income countries, again, we've got substantial progress. Death rates have gone down really quite spectacularly. When there's the under five mortality, the blue line, well, it's gone down from about just over 3% down to well under 1%. And there's the probability that a five-year-old will die before age, before age 50. And again, that's gone down by more than half. Um, and there is a little kink there caused by the HIV epidemic in rich countries, but it's hardly noticeable on this scale. And then there's this rather spectacular decrease in the probability that a 50 year old will die before 70. And then the middle income countries are rather intermediate between these trends. So the overall picture is favorable where you don't have local catastrophe like the HIV epidemic in Africa. Um, and so, so the overall thing is now, again, though, low income countries, middle income countries, high income countries, it's too many different things. We need, to, we need to be able to somehow look a bit more finely. Now with 200 countries, we can't look separately at 200 countries, but we can say that the, we can look at the most populous countries, the 25 most populous countries, Britain is just in, Spain is just out. So 25 most populous countries, the ones with 1% of the world's population or more, um, actually account for three quarters of world population. So if we take the 25 most populous countries, they account for 75% of the 2010 world population. And the trends in that 75% are much the same as the trends in the remaining 25%. So we can just look at the 25 most populous countries to get a range in possibilities. And so I want to look at the trends in mortality rates from 1970 to 2010, those same little colored lines by age. But now I'm going to look at the 25 countries their trends in infant mortality, under five mortality. 25 countries, trends in mortality from five to 50. 25 countries, trends in mortality, 50 to 69. Okay, so here we go for the under five mortality. And you can see some spectacular changes. Um, the African countries did have very high death rates in general, and they've had enormous decreases, but there have been substantial decreases in, say, Bangladesh, and particularly in Egypt. I mean, it's decreased from about 24% dead to about 3 or 4% dead before age five in Egypt, and you know, due to changes in sanitary conditions. But there's been enormous changes. Um, this is South Africa, sorry, things on dots, and that kink there is because the HIV epidemic in South Africa was so bad that it even reversed the improvement in under five mortality. Um, and then, but you've got, look at the changes in Iran and in Turkey, in China, 
in Thailand. Look, look at these changes. I mean, they're, they're pretty spectacular. And although Russia, there was this huge economic collapse and you know, massive changes in, in adult mortality, but child mortality carried on going down. In the US, UK, finally, they're so low that you can't really get much lower. These are the developed countries over here. So it's overall, it's, it's a very favorable picture. And what you did find in Africa was that while at the beginning in Ethiopia, for example, while you've got famine and civil war, you don't get improvement. When things settle down quite a lot, then child mortality, under five mortality drops quite spectacularly. In Pakistan, I mean, it's, it's a very disrupted society in many places, but overall, under five mortality has gone down by half between 1970 and 2010. So the overall picture is favorable. Um, you can see, look at some other countries. There's, I've picked out India, China, and the USA in all of these graphs. So there's India, there's China, there's the USA. Um, and when we look at the next age group, the pictures are rather different. So, so the probability of the five-year-old will die before 50. Well, there's enormous effects of HIV and various other things. So here are the trends. And look, it's, look at the crazy trends here for South Africa. There's overall cause mortality. What's the probability of a five-year-old to die before 50? Well, it was going down in the 1980s and then it reversed completely and went shooting up. And then since treatment's been introduced and really been given, it's come down again. And if you look at this separately for males and females, it's even more extreme for females because they had higher HIV death rates. Um, Ethiopia, um, you know, here's Congo, Ethiopia. Again, not much progress. And there's Nigeria. Not much progress when there's a lot of civil disruption. But as soon as you get reasonably stable societies, then the death rates drop. And Myanmar, I mean, what has Myanmar been doing right over this period? You know, it's, it's quite contrary to the image we've got of them. Um, anyway, so the mortality, the probability of a five-year-old will die before 50, has gone down from 30% down to about 12%. Here's Russia, really not doing well. And that's the effect of alcohol. Philippines, I'm not sure. If, I'm not certain about the data for the Philippines. Um, and here, Thailand, I, I thought that was the HIV epidemic, but it isn't. It's the epidemic of actually deaths from external causes, particularly traffic accidents. If you drink and or use drugs and ride motorbikes, then you finish up with high death. Thailand's got the highest traffic death rate in the world. It's particularly true in young men. This is males and females together. It's even more true in young males. And then the other spectacular exception is Iran. If you looked in Iranian women, this is men and women together. If you looked in Iranian women, you'd see steady progress. And in Iranian men, you'd see an enormous increase in mortality because Saddam Hussein invaded Iran and killed a million Iranians, nearly all of them were men. So this is war, we've got war here, we've got, well, famine here, we've got pestilence there, HIV, and you know, I don't know what we've got in here, we've actually got vodka, I'll come back to that in a minute. So naming the countries again, there's Iran, there's South Africa, there's India, United States, not very satisfactory progress, and China, now lower mortality than the United States in, in these in early adult life. And then the last age group, the 50 to 69, again, progress nearly everywhere, um, but there's Nigeria, not much progress. There's South Africa with HIV, and here we've got Congo, surprisingly steady progress, Myanmar and put in the big ones, India, China, United States. And here's Ethiopia, you know, surprisingly there's, there's progress. There's, the overall picture is one of progress. The overall picture is just one of progress. And the obvious exception is Russia. Now, I want to just discuss Russia. The key, the key thing that's gone wrong here is vodka. When communism collapsed, particularly when, when communism collapsed, there was a catastrophic increase in death from vodka, but it was high anyway. I want to compare Russian death rates with UK death rates. And with apologies, I'm going to introduce one more age group. I'm going to say, what's the probability that a 15 year old will die before 55? And I want to include vodka drinking starts at in early adult life. So I've just done this, Just this is just for looking at vodka analysis. Now this is 
These are the trends in mortality in the United Kingdom. So the white dots are females, the black dots are males, and there's the tail end of the decrease in tobacco deaths. You can see 15 to 54, they'll list the tobacco deaths are at older ages than that. And you can see this, this decrease. Now, the, I want to just look at the females, UK females, and compare them with Russian females. So I'm going to get rid of the UK males, I'm going to put in Russian females. So here you can see a much more irregular pattern in Russian females, and they coincide with changes in vodka consumption. So here's where Gorbachev came in and restricted alcohol. There were the Gorbachev anti-alcohol laws and the death rates went down. Vodka con spirits consumption went down by nearly all vodka, went down by a quarter, the deaths went down by a quarter. Then there was a gradual fading of communist control over things like vodka consumption, more and more black market. Then the Soviet Union ends here, the USSR collapses, and there's all the restrictions on um, vodka disappear Everything else goes wrong. The price of food goes up. The price of drink goes down. You know, and just you know, total social disruption. Even the birth rate dropped by half. There was such total disruption in the early 1990s. Half of industry basically shut down. Even if you did have a job, you probably weren't getting paid. And if you got some money saved up, then in those very few years, you would lose 96% of it because there was 2,500% inflation. It's a total social collapse. Things stabilised in mid 1990s. Then there was the East, East Asian banking crisis spread to Russia, and again, there was this collapse of industry and things got worse. So by 2005, it got really high death rates, and then they started to try to make alcohol regulations. First Medvedev and then Putin um, started trying to get alcohol regulations, and consumption has gone down by about a third, and as you can see, female mortality has gone down by about a third. And I've told this story on women, and I want to now look at the story for men, and it's quite extraordinary. So there's UK male death rates down the bottom. Steady progress, things have been getting a little bit worse in the 2010s. And this is what's happened in Russia. I mean, absolutely terrible. I mean, here, I mean, 2005 death rates, the probability of death before age 55 would have been one third for Russian men, but more than one third, 37% at the death rates of 2005. Now it's down to 20%. If Russia could actually get control of vodka deaths and tobacco deaths. There's no reason why Russia shouldn't have death rates as low as those in Western Europe. There's no reason at all. You just gotta take seriously the big causes. We did a study in um, Russia. We took, um, we took, um, here we go, where are we go to right, 1990 to 200 here, 2000. We took 12 years, 1990 to 2000, all the deaths in that 12 year period in three big Russian cities and went knocking on the doors asking what the dead person used to drink and you could relate what they died what they died from to what they used to drink if you want to know what a russian man drinks ask his wife after he's dead you know god he used to drink a bottle of two, two three bottles of vodka at the session when he was getting drunk and so on and these were the sort of results we got we i wanted to compare drinkers with non-drinkers but we couldn't because there weren't any non-drinkers so we compared what about a bottle of vodka a day versus less than one bottle of vodka a week. And by a bottle a day, that doesn't mean a bottle a day. It means two or three bottles of vodka every two or three days. And, and so they had four times these drinkers, had four times the death rate from traffic accidents, six times the death rates from other accidents, eight times the risk of committing suicide, and 10 times the risk of being murdered. And for females, there weren't nearly as many serious drinkers in females. It was 15 times the risk of committing suicide and 20 times the risk of being murdered because drunken women hang out with horrible men. Um, and it just, alcohol is the main cause of the high rates and rapid fluctuations of premature adult mortality in Russia, the cause. So, so we've got where you get things going spectacularly wrong. Think, okay, you can get death rates going the wrong way around, but overall things are getting better. So before COVID, tobacco, HIV, alcohol, adiposity, overweight, and war, these are the only big causes of death that have fluctuated substantially since 1990 in some large populations after you allow for population growth. I mean, if, you get, if the population gets twice as big, then you're gonna get twice as many deaths. I'm looking at death rates here. And tobacco, for example, China, HIV, for example, Southern Africa, alcohol, for example, Russia, adiposity, well, for example, Mexico, and war, well, plenty of examples, Rwanda, and you know, well, there's plenty of places where wars caused national death rates to fluctuate and civil disruption caused by war has really, really limited progress in various African populations. But 
where's the where things aren't going spectacularly wrong they're going spectacularly right overall we're doing better and i wanted to deal briefly with COVID. and i want to deal with COVID in this country briefly because there's been so much discussed so i'll deal briefly with it um people talk about the number of uk deaths with COVID as a cause and the total number of deaths is a very unsatisfactory statistic because it includes a lot of people who are already very old or more abundant. If you're on the point of dying in an old people's home and COVID comes through the old people's home, then they, that may finish you off. And when that happened back in March and April, then you didn't necessarily get the death put down to COVID. You could finish up getting it put down to whatever you're dying from anyway. If you're lying there paralysed with a stroke and you're going to die anyway, then if COVID comes in and you die from that, you might finish up with, especially because tests weren't available, you could finish up with stroke being put down as the cause of death, which in a sense it was a cause of the death, but COVID not getting put down because, you know, nobody's going to test if somebody's demented or paralysed and dying in old people's homes. So it's an unsatisfactory statistic because a lot of the deaths were actually deaths of people who were already very old or moribund. But if you want to get the total number, if you want to cite that statistic, which a number of newspapers keep on doing, um, they can do it. They do it by comparing the average weekly numbers of deaths was what used to be true in 2019. Or so. Then we need to we need to correct these numbers for under certification for COVID not getting written on the death certificate, particularly in March and April. Nowadays, they'd get it more right, but in March and April, they didn't because the tests weren't available. OK, so here's some UK trends. Um, and I'm just looking at the first wave. I'm just looking at the first wave of the epidemic in, in England. So from March, June, actually, it was March, April, May, really. Um, and here's all-cause mortality, total number of deaths in, in England, weekly deaths. Um, the squares represent three weeks at a time, the circles one week at a time. You have to do that because you get irregularities of the number of deaths registered on bank holidays. So whereas a bank holiday would take three weeks of deaths instead of one week of deaths, but that's a detail. And there's the average for 2015 to 2019. And you can see this large spike in deaths, okay. And over here, it looks as though actually the number of deaths is fewer than would have been expected at the death rates of 2015 to 19. That's partly because some of those who are actually in the process of dying who would have died then had already got killed off by COVID. Then when you split them and you say, was COVID mentioned at all on the death certificate? Well, there's the big spike in COVID's death, COVID deaths being mentioned. That's the first wave. And these are the government figures you get on, was COVID mentioned on the death certificates? The Office of National Statistics figures. But there's COVID not mentioned on the death certificate. You see, just in March and April, you've got this rather marked excess, you know, something about 19,000 extra deaths. Um, and what is this? And it's interesting when you split it according to whether these deaths were in a care home or not in a care home, the large majority of them was in a care home. This excess, it was an excess of deaths in care homes with COVID not mentioned on the death certificate. So here we've got overall, with COVID mentioned on the death certificate, there's death in a care home, death not in a care home. But what about COVID not mentioned on the death certificate? Well, there's deaths in a care home, that huge rate spike there in March, April, May, and there's deaths not in a care home. So you've got about 15,000, 16,000 here, and only about 3,000 here. And yet we've got 100 times as many people not in a care home as we have in a care home. That's not fair because you've got a good old age, but you know, most old people are not in care homes. And yet that's where the excess was of death with COVID not mentioned. So, OK, how many deaths did we have? Well, my estimate, done with Valerie Burrell, is probably there have been, in that first wave, that there were probably about 75,000 deaths from COVID, not 40,000, as the government figures were saying, not 50,000, as the ONS figures were saying, but about 75,000. There were 56,000 death certificates that mentioned COVID. Those are the ones that the ONS, Office of National Statistics, attributes to COVID. Um, and then there's about 19,000 others, mainly in care homes, 15,000 in care homes, about 4,000 elsewhere. And these probably were deaths where COVID was a cause, but it was killing somebody at a time when tests weren't available March, April, May, and when, um, and somebody where it would be plausible to put down another thing as having been a cause, like dementia 
or end-stage Parkinson's or end-stage stroke or something like that. So in a way, these, I don't want to say they're deaths that don't matter, but they are deaths of people who were actually moribund with very poor quality of life and no prospect of any good quality of life. So it's, it, they're not, that's why I say that it's not really what it seems and that overall the total number of deaths isn't a very good statistic. Anyway, for what it's worth, here it is. These are, these are my estimates. Um, and here I've marked in red the number of deaths um, where before age 70, about 9,000. So we've got a total of about 75,000 deaths, 9,000 before age 70. There are about 15,000 old people in their 70s like me. And then about 50,000 of people 80 plus in their 80s or 90s. And those, those, I think, are the numbers. And these pluses are the ones that I'd attribute to COVID and the government statistics don't. But this adds up to a total of 75,000, which is roughly the number of excess deaths if you just compare the whole country um, with as, as, as deaths happened in 2020 with what was happening in previous years. So in terms of premature death, it's not big numbers. And you can think of it in terms of death rates as well, percent death rate. This is within the first wave, so this just covers a five month period. Okay, so it is, COVID is lots of deaths, but in rich countries, they're mostly over 70. And as I'm over 70 myself, I'm not saying deaths over 70 don't matter, but I am saying other things being equal. The death of somebody like me at age 77 doesn't matter as much as the death of somebody age 57 or 37. So back to the death before 70. Okay, so here we've got 30 million deaths before 70 that I've mentioned before. What are the causes of these childhood deaths, deaths in early adult life, deaths in middle age? Well, the 7 million deaths in 2010, the causes were about 2 million dying in the process of being born, about another million from pneumonia, another million diarrhea, getting on for a million malaria. Now, these numbers would now be more like half a million. These numbers are going down. They're all less than a million now. So things are, things are improving very rapidly. And it's because of huge international efforts that that's happening. What about the next age range? Five to 34. So, it, and we can keep on, we can keep on pressing. We can get the perinatal death rates down, but we've got to actually put effort into doing it. You need somebody there when a woman is giving birth to get the kid out alive and also to stop the woman suffering a horrible hemorrhage. Because, I mean, there's another had a quarter of a million women die in the process of having a baby. So there's, you, you need appropriate birth attendance. It doesn't have to be a th th tier three hospital, but it does need to be somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Um, then in the next age range, five million deaths, five to 34, two million deaths from injuries, accident, violence, suicide, about a million deaths from HIV. That's gone down now. This is 2010 death rates and two million from various other diseases. So we've got to do something about HIV, which is being done. We've got to do something about injuries. And these are avoidable, they're preventable. And you can see that by looking at time trends and international comparisons. I'll take suicide for a start. Just but there happen to be reasonable police records running right back for more than 100 years, 1880, 1920, 1962, for suicide in Sri Lanka. And when poisonous pesticides came in, it suddenly became convenient to commit suicide. And when the most poisonous one got banned, it dropped. Then they went to other ones. Then the next ones got banned, the next ones got banned. So you see, these, these bans on pesticides alone just make it inconvenient. You get lower suicide rates. This is, you know, suicide is something where the convenience of it, you know, nets underneath the Golden Gate Bridge will make a difference to the suicide rate. Homicide rates, there are enormous differences between one country and another. Here's the UK. So it zigzags so much, this is daily. So this is homicide rates among young adults, 15 to 34. And you know, the rate per 100,000 per year is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 per million per year. So 20 year risk, 15 to 34, it's the property of 15 year olds gonna get murdered before 35. It's gonna be two per 100,000, 0.002%, really very low. And there have been high rates at times of political problems spilling over a mile. And I think there's Dr. Shipman down here somewhere as well, they didn't actually kill young people. But with all the newspapers being full of knife crime and murders and so on as they are, look how low the death rate is. Look how it compares with what was happening. It's quite an, it's quite an interesting perspective. It's different from what you'd think, but it's clearly, this is clearly something that's under political control. 
Now, the other reason it's under political control, if we look at these death rates now in the 2010s in the UK and compare them with the US, the US has death rates 100 times higher. Here's the US numbers. So we've got risks of two per 100,000. They've got risks of 200 per 230 per 100,000 up at the top there. 0.002%, 0.2% murdered. And these are the, the trends, but look at the scale, look how different the scales are. The scales have about a 15 fold difference between them. And look at the US death rate now, which is 0.4%, 24, 20 year risk in males, compared with this tiny risk down here. There's a difference of a hundred fold. And within the US, there's enormous heterogeneity. There's enormous heterogeneity of the risk between black and white, between educated and uneducated. You take these risks and you just look at them separately over on the left, forget the time trends. Um, this is just 2010 to 2015 here, the last bar on each set. And this is the probability of dying at ages 25 to 34. Just, I'm just taking that, that age range because it's conveniently available, 10 year risk of death um, from firearms, which is red. So you, if you're black and uneducated, you're 2.2% chance of being shot and killed between age 25 and 34, and a 4% chance of dying. If you're black and educated, these risks are much lower. If you're white and uneducated, they're much lower than uneducated blacks. Uneducated means no college degree. And then if you're white and educated, then the risks are less than a 20th as great. So there's this enormous variation. These things are political, they can be affected by political choices. Okay, now the main thing I want to concentrate on is non-communicable disease, vascular disease, cancer. So 18 million deaths a year in middle age, half of them are from vascular disease or cancer, another quarter are from other non-communicable diseases. And then you've got communicable TB and pneumonia mainly, and injury, which I've already talked about, accidents particularly. So can we, if we're going to do anything, can we have can, vascular mortality and cancer mortality? Um, well, yes, if we look at what's happened. In Britain, vascular mortality decreased fourfold between 1980 and 2010, treatment and prevention. So here's, the top is males, the bottom's females, as always in the UK, it's unfair to males, they have higher death rates. So that's the decrease in smoking and better treatments. And the plus is the average of male and female together. So this is 1950, 1970, 1990, 2010, along the bottom axis. And you've got 16% dying from vascular disease at 1980 death rates, 4% at 2010 death rates. And so wonderful changes. And they could be, you could get similar changes in other places where the vascular death rates are high. But for, if we want to get vascular death rates down worldwide, we need to use the preventive measures that work, particularly tobacco control, and if possible, avoiding obesity, and also treatments, treatments that work, but they don't work if they're not given. So one global thing that needs doing is secondary prevention. Among those who've already had a heart attack or stroke and have still got a good quality life, then make sure that they actually take affordable, we got the affordable availability and widespread use of generic statins, blood pressure, and drugs, aspirin, they don't cost much, they don't work if they're not used. This would be practicable in high and in middle income populations. And the aim should be to treat high risk, high risk of losing a lot of lives by death in the near future. Don't treat high blood pressure, don't treat high cholesterol, treat high risk of something going seriously wrong in the next few years. And it's not just high risk, because if you say high risk, that would be the old people, of course, the 90 year olds got high risk, but you don't lose much if you die at 90. But if somebody's in their 50s have had a heart attack or stroke, they should be on 60s. They should be on medication that just that reduces by much more than half the risk of something else happening. You don't need to screen the whole population to find those who to treat. You're not medicalizing apparently well individuals. Okay, what are the avoidable causes of vascular mortality? Tobacco, blood pressure, blood lipids, and being fat. And I'll give one slide to each of them. So tobacco. Family Browse, a million women study. So ask a million women in this country what they smoke. It's my generation of women, women born in the late 30s, early 40s. Ask them what they smoke and look at the death rates. There's heart disease, there's stroke. One is the never smokers. So here's the light smokers, three times the risk of dying from a heart attack. So if you're, and 
there's an average smoker and there's a heavy smoker. Don't talk about heavy smoking. It's not that heavy smoking is dangerous. Light smoking is dangerous. Same with stroke. If you're a light smoker, it's probably the most dangerous thing you do. Yeah, okay, heavy smoking is worse, but light smoking. So smoking is very good at causing vascular disease and cancer and various other things. Okay, that's tobacco done. What about blood pressure? Well, in the, in the people listening to this talk now, there'll be people with blood pressure of 110, 130, 150. Every 20 millimeter difference in systolic blood pressure makes a twofold difference in vascular mortality. This comes from study of a million adults. Actually, it comes from putting together about 60 studies that added up to a million adults in total. It's the Prospective Studies Collaboration, Sarah Lundin's project. And here's on a doubling scale, heart disease death rates, and here on a linear scale, his blood pressure, 120, 140, 160, 180. You don't get very many 180s nowadays. And you can see that every 20 millimeters difference makes a twofold difference in risk. This is people in their 40s, 50s, 60s. At each age, the same is true. Beautiful. And blood pressure is controllable. There are drugs that work. It's difficult. You can't get the blood pressure down 20 millimeters, but you get it down 10 millimeters, and that'll reduce risk by a third. Blood lipids. Similarly, you take one pill a day now, and you change British blood cholesterol into a Chinese peasant blood cholesterol. You know, a good generic statin might reduce LDL cholesterol by two millimoles per litre, depending on where you start from, or you know, one and a half millimoles or something like that. And that will take vascular risk down by about 40%. Statins don't affect non-vascular mortality. So total mortality goes down accordingly. We can take the reduction. We can reduce occlusive vascular disease, heart attacks or occlusive strokes by about 40% by one pill a day. It's cheap, three quid, a, three quid a month health service. What about being fat? How important is being overweight? Well, my BMI is 25, so I'm just on the boundary between lean or normal and overweight. Boundary between this defined by WHO is 25. Well, if my BMI was 35, I'd be 40% heavier. That's a lot. And I'd have vascular, my vascular death rate would be twice as big. It pushes up blood pressure, it pushes up blood lipids, it causes diabetes, and it would double your risk. Conversely, you go down from 35 to 25, but that's very difficult to do. Weight loss is very difficult to do. It's nowhere near as easy as modifying blood pressure, blood lipids with pills. I don't go for morality, actually. I don't think that weight loss is somehow moral and pills aren't moral. I don't know what actually works in terms of reducing deaths. Okay, cancer, let's half cancer. Well, treatment and prevention. A nice example of treatment is the improvements in breast cancer mortality over the last 20 years. So here's UK and US breast cancer death rate in the under 70s, 35 to 69. And look, here's where in the 1980s treatments started to get better and they got better and better and better and better. And the death rate's down a half of what it was. That is better treatment, finding the cancers, better surgery, better radiotherapy, better endocrine therapy, better chemotherapy. Each one of those has contributed and overall the death rate's gone down a half of what it was. Well, the same thing's happened. There's, I'll take the US. Here's the US death rates from breast cancer. I want to compare them with US death rates in American women from lung cancer. Here is the breast cancer you just saw in American women. And here is lung cancer in American women. What's caused these trends over the last... So this is always the same. 1950, 1970, 1990, 2010. Lung cancer, cigarettes. That's driven it up and it's driving it down now. Changes in smoking. Breast cancer, better treatment. Colorectal cancer, better treatment, although it's difficult to see because it's going down anyway, but it has actually improved since the 1990s. Um, and stomach cancer, we don't know why it's gone down. Treatment's not that great. And cervix cancer has been, uterine cancer has been due to cervix screening mainly. Okay, so that's driving the trends. Now for the male trends, see the top of the female is, look, you've got I mean, more than 2% of American women were dying from lung cancer. Well, We've got to use a totally different scale if we want to do men. We don't do 2%. We need a much, much higher scale. Because in men, they were running at about 5% were dying in middle age from lung cancer. And in men, what's causing the trends is the decrease in lung cancer caused not by better treatment, but by reduction in smoking. 
colorectal, you can see the trend, the improvement there a bit. I quite like that trend because I was going to die of colorectal cancer a few years ago and they treated me and it went away. Um, prostate, better treatment, stomach again, we don't know why. So if we just try and summarize smoking versus not smoking in America, then that's what US male cancer mortality trends should have looked like if nobody had ever smoked. You can see the improvement since 1990, since 1990 in the treatment. So that horizontal line there, and that's what was added to it by smoking. And there's the same thing for women. And the improvement since 1990 is particularly due to the nice decrease in deaths from breast cancer. And that's what's been added to it by smoking. So smoking is still in the United States in 2010, it was still causing about 30% of all cancer deaths. Crazy. But it was causing half all cancer deaths in the men back in the 1980s. And the UK is even more extreme. If you remember, here's the UK on the same scale. Now look at the males, look on the left-hand panel to the males. We go from the US to UK. Look at it, just crazy. You know, back in 1970, we should have been having about 6% of men die, die from smoking. Instead, we had 6 plus 8, just over 14% dying from smoking. And that's for the population as a whole, obviously, for the smokers, it was worse. And here's women. There's, you know, that's what the breast cancer, that's what cancer mortality should have looked like in UK women. Nice decreases due to treatment of colon cancer and breast cancer. And that's what's been added to it by smoking. So it's still a quarter of all cancer deaths here. Yeah, there's other things that matter. When you talk about cancer prevention, we've got chronic infection, human papillomavirus, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, H. pylori, stomach cancer, dietary factors, being fat, getting aflatoxin contamination, environmental things, cold smoke, radiation, asbestos, alcohol, and tick. But these are all small in comparison, well, not so small, but in comparison with tobacco and to some extent alcohol smoking still about 25% of the UK cancer deaths, 25% of the US cancer deaths. Um, I'll run through the next few slides I was going to show because I'm getting to the end of my time because I want to just finish up talking about what we might do about tobacco. So there's lung cancer mortality versus smoking versus non-smoking, you know, 10 times as big if you're a light smoker as if you're a never smoker. It's all-cause mortality, twice as big as night smokers as in never smokers, many women study again. And just for comparison, the other thing that's supposed to be ever so important is stress and worry. Well, they also asked them whether they were happy or not. So there's smoking, daily cigarette consumption, you know, light smokers, heavy smokers, and there's whether you're happy or not. Are you happy most of the time? Usually, sometimes, rarely, never. Yeah, spot the difference. Worry about the things that matter. Worry about the big things. And stopping works. Okay, smoking kills, stopping works. Okay, I'm going to jump on towards the end as to what we could do about smoking. Maybe this is, you know, if you're okay, let's stop in work. So, okay, there's a big increase in smoking in the, U in the UK. This is running from 1890 to, 20, to um, 2014, so from the 19th century, right the way through two wars, and then there's the decrease. And the two biggest falls came when there were big price increases. Labour government in the 1940s, Conservative government in the 1980s, both had economic problems, both the price of facts up. And that's when we've got the sharpest decreases in consumption. And it's even more extreme if you look at France or South Africa. Between 1990 and 2005, South Africa and France both tripled the price of cigarettes. Consumption went down by half, so we get half the number of tobacco deaths. And the real tax yield doubles, so they get far more dollars. So in terms of, you know, French went from 6 billion euro, real euros to 12 billion real euros in tax. Where th the place where things is really going wrong is China. It's an increasing proportion of male deaths due to smoking. 10% of deaths in 1990, 20% now, and it's going to be 30% in the 2030s. In numbers, it's even bigger because the population is also growing. And that's the number of deaths we're going to get per year from smoking unless there's widespread cessation. At the moment, worldwide, not all ages, not just under 70, we've got about 2 million tobacco deaths in rich countries, a million under 70, a million over 70 about a million a year in China, about a million a year in India, and about five or six million worldwide. It's going to be 10 million for mid-century if we keep on smoking where we are. 10 million deaths is 100 million per decade. What does 100 million per decade? Well, we've had 100 million deaths in the first 20 years of this century. If we keep on the way we are, we're going to have about 250 million more in the next 30 years. Then we're going to be running at more than 100 million a decade. 
in the second half of the century. So in total, about a billion tobacco deaths a year this century, if we keep smoking the way we are with 30% starting and most not stopping, compared with 100 million in the last century. Okay, I'll skip on and finish. I've got this is my penultimate slide, and the last one is one that I've already shown. Worldwide, government profit and tax on tobacco now add up to about 300 billion a year. So the governments are getting 300 billion a year from tobacco. Okay, World Health Organization target is for smoking to go down by a third by 2030. If we want to do something about non-communicable diseases, yes, that's a very important target. Now, if the real price stays constant and smoking does go down by a third, the government's going to lose about 100 billion a year in taxes and profits. Well, that's not big money for governments, but it's not that small either. It's big enough to be interesting to them. But if the real price doubles, and this alone will reduce smoking by a third, but the net effect would be the government would gain about 100 billion a year. And I think that this bottom line is plausible these middle lines are not plausible, especially with the economic crisis caused by COVID. Governments are not going to give up 100 billion a year, but they might well go for getting an extra 100 billion a year. If you're going to tax something, why not make it cigarettes and save a lot of lives? We could avoid hundreds of thousands, sorry, hundreds of millions of tobacco deaths this century if we take tobacco control seriously, and that must include price and smuggling control. So, Final slide. Before COVID, tobacco, HIV, alcohol, adiposity, and war, these were the only big cause of death that had increased substantially since 1990 in some large populations. Death in old age is inevitable. Death before old age is not. And when are we going to get that 36% down to 18%? Well, in the 2030s, maybe, earlier or later in the 2030s, by 2014, perhaps. 2040 would be nice, I'll be 97 then, so let's hope it's by 2040. But it's, it's doable just by taking seriously the big cause. You can avoid far more deaths by moderate reduction in big cause than you can by big reduction in a small cause. Um, thank you all very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, Richard. That was absolutely fascinating. If you're able to stop sharing screen, we've got a few questions that are coming through that I can feed through to you. Okay, I think I've stopped. I think you have. Um, okay, so just a reminder to people watching, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask them in the chat box below the YouTube um, video, or you can follow the link also in the YouTube video just below, um, which will take you to a Google Docs where you can write in any questions you might have. So um, the first question is from Tom Seddon. What have been the best intervention strategies to reduce smoking? Are these the same across different countries? I think the key thing is that price, well, first you've got to have information to get the population politically on your side. Um, and then, but information works much more on educated people than on educated people. So there was, you know, back in the 1960s, 1970s, there was a huge de decrease in British smoking in social class one, a pretty well no change or even an increase in social class five and, in, and among the unemployed. And then really the Labour government, you've got to, you've got to prevent manipulation by advertising. Um, and by packets and by point of display sales, you know, whatever. And a rough rule is just you should trust the tobacco industry, just trust the tobacco industry, whatever it is they really want to prevent, then do that. They don't care too much about schools programs. OK, well, OK, they may be right. I mean, I'll trust them. I, I won't care too much about schools programs, but they really, really care if you start banning advertising, if you start banning sports promotion, if you start not letting them have, you know, putting in plain packaging, they really hate that. So, okay, if they hate it, I should trust them. They studied the subject much more than I do. I trust them completely. So whatever they really don't want to do, then do that. And they argue very strongly against tax increases. Um, and, and, but there is very good evidence on tax increases. It's, 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 it's an odd pattern. I mean, it's, it's, I think you've got to take a perspective of many, many decades on tobacco control. And the first really clear evidence came in the mid 20th century. By the 1960s, the evidence of the overall risk was pretty serious. That's 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And we still, we still got something like a quarter of cancer deaths caused by smoking. But if you look over the decades, we've made a lot of progress. It's actually saved more lives than you know, all the progress in cancer treatment put together. 
So I just did, I think, just push the things that manipulate image, push the things that manipulate price, make sure you don't produce too big a black market in terms of smuggling. I mean, there's, 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 overall, things are getting better in many countries. The big one that's got to take it seriously is China still. They haven't taken it seriously, but they do take health seriously, the Chinese government. They just haven't really got this one right. And I think it would be possible for them to choose to do so and then really to act. That would be a wonderful example to the world and, to, you know, and a huge effect within China. Chinese men constitute 8% of the world's population and smoke 40% of the world's cigarettes. Gosh, that's quite a statistic. Sorry, I'm going to give a much shorter answer to the next one. I know, that, that was Make great. Next one, yes, no question. <laughs> well, this might work. Um, is it possible to halve deaths from suicide? Yes, although I, I don't know that we can get them down entirely. Um, I, I think if you look at the international variation in suicide rates, then yes, there is quite substantial international variation if you look at the variation from one time to another, then there's a big variation from one time to another. These both speak to avoidability. So I think, could we halve suicide rates worldwide? Yes, probably. And it's a million deaths a year, nearly a million deaths a year. Um, could we abolish suicide? No, not by anything remotely foreseeable. And the, the relevance of medication, of various other things, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to study. You could, I suppose one could study effects of medication on suicidal ideation, but it would be very difficult to do studies with suicide itself as an endpoint because it's, it, well, for obvious reasons, it'd be very difficult to do practical studies. But the variation, the differences between one population and another, differences within one population between one period and another, the differences between one population between different groups, different social classes, these all point to avoidability. So, Yes, halving, um, but, and concentrate on the places where you've got the, the highest rates. And you know, the, the, the lesson that convenience matters is really important. The convenience of suicide makes a big difference to the likelihood of suicide. You don't want guns to be conveniently available in America. In this country, when we switched over from poisonous home gas into non-poisonous home gas, the suicide rate from gas dropped instantly because it wasn't poisonous anymore. And the suicide rate for other things didn't go up. Convenience matters. So make suicide inconvenient and try to make there be convenient ways of doing something else. Gosh, thank you. What an answer. Um, brilliant. Thanks. So our next question is, why were Britain such big smokers compared to the rest of Europe? And then why did they stop? The improvements came long before the smoking ban. Oh, yeah. Um, well, there was a lot of publicity um, in the 1960s, starting from the Royal College of General Practitioners in 1962. Um, there was a lot of publicity, but it was, it, and it, it carried on, smoking just carried on increasing all the way through the 50s, 60s. Um, and it reached its maximum in 1973, 23 years after the first conclusive evidence of hazard had come out. So it was a quarter of a century later, the rates were much higher than they had been in 1950. Then we banned advertising. It's easy to manipulate populations. I mean, we've seen this with you know, Brexit, with Trump getting elected, all sorts of things, how easy it is to manipulate populations. Advertisers know how to manipulate populations. And if you actually let them advertise, they can manipulate things like this. We shouldn't have them manipulating the image of something as lethal as cigarettes. They can you know, manipulate images of other things, you know, black sweaters or nice necklaces or something like that but not, not cigarettes, it's too dangerous. I mean, you, you know, what else is there that's causing 5 million deaths a year? You know, you, you get, a, I mean, last week, there were 100,000 deaths from tobacco last week. This week, there's going to be another 100,000 deaths from tobacco, and these are real deaths. Gosh, when you put it like that, it really is astounding that cigarettes are still, well, alcohol is still advertised and cigarettes are still able to... Well, alcohol's a different, alcohol's very different. It isn't anywhere near the number of deaths from cigarettes in this country. And most of when, when alcohol kills people, it's partly by accidents and violence. And it's also partly by disease. And those diseases, the, the ways in which alcohol, the diseases by which alcohol kills people, it, it's much less good at doing it if you don't smoke. But if you smoke and then drink, then it's going to cause quite a big risk of cancer of the mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus. But if you don't smoke and drink, then yes, there's an excess, but it's much less extreme. So, so alcohol aggravates the risks of, smoke, of smoking as a cause of disease. Um, 
so it, it, it yeah, I think I think alcohol. I think it's really the social things of alcohol that perhaps matter in this country more than the actual number of deaths from alcohol. And there are deaths, there are injuries. There's a lot of unpleasantness. If you get into an accident in the emergency department on Saturday night, you'll see it. But it's in a way, it's the it's the social aspects, the sort of the, the both the pleasure and obstruction of family life. I mean, there's a nice way in which alcohol can make things go more pleasantly, but also it can make things go horribly wrong when you get to, when it just gets out of control in family pathology. And when you think of what the family pathology must have been like in Russia, with, and, and still is, with that amount of vodka consumption, it's just it was horrible. It's just such a waste of, of you know of the lives of the men and of the others in their families, mostly men. One of the reasons why Russia's got one of the highest murder rates in the world. Well, not highest in the world, but one a very high murder rate among developed countries. Uh, our next question is from Rose Stevens, and um, she asks, what do you predict the effects of COVID-19 to be on medium term mortality rates beyond this year? How do you expect this to vary by countries of different income level? Well, it depends partly how vaccination goes. Um, the, the vaccination results are getting interesting. I mean, the spectacular results earlier this month, I mean, it was a total of 252 cases in the unvaccinated versus 13 in the vaccinated, 252 versus 13, the mRNA vaccine. It's very beautiful, 95% efficacy. And then there's the adenovirus um, vaccines that have come out. There's the Oxford vaccine trial that was announced um, a couple of days ago. But also the Russian one is turning out to be more interesting than it was thought to have been. So the Sputnik one is actually turning out to be quite interesting. They've used a different strategy on adenoviruses. They've used two different adenoviruses for the initial dose and the second dose so that you don't go and vaccinate against the virus itself by giving, you know, you, don't want, to, you, you, want, you want the vaccination to teach the body how to reject spike protein. But if you teach it to reject the vaccine itself, then, you know, maybe you'll actually finish up rejecting the second dose for the wrong reason. Um, Anyway, that, that's, it's not clear whether that's relevant. I mean, the vaccine experts will sort that out. I mean, that may be just idle talk. But it's clear that vaccination works much better than we would have thought it did based on where we were on the 1st of November. November 2020 is going to be a great month in medical history. I mean, it's really, it's really beautiful to get these vaccine results. Um, and it, what we need now is something that's widely affordable and deployable. We need, we really need a tenfold difference in price. It's got to be, we want something that doesn't need a minus 70 cold chain and it doesn't cost $40 a shot. And the, the new vaccines that are coming out fulfill both of those criteria and they, they won't necessarily be the best. And the Sputnik one, if their results are genuine, then they may well also be running at the round, something like 90 odd percent efficacy, which would be very interesting for what is essentially a low cost, widely practical vaccine. But it, it, I think the overall conclusion is that vaccination can work. How long it protects for, we don't know, but it's going to work. And so that's going to transform. If we can get things that really could be used worldwide, that's going to transform um, COVID control. I would say it's going to be relatively minor compared with um, various other public health problems. I mean, obviously, we're in the middle of the second wave now, and it's not going to go away. And there's going to be a lot more people get ill and a lot more people die. And I hope I'm not one of them. But it's, it, I think it's going to be a controllable epidemic. I think, I think 2021 is, if we can get global vaccination really to happen, there's a lot of forces trying to make it happen. And we'll now have the United States really trying to collaborate wholeheartedly with the World Health, Health Organization again. Then it may well be that we can get serious control and that 2021 will be the last bad year for COVID. I think that's. I think that may well be the case, but we'll see. I mean, obviously, it's going to do a lot more damage. It's going to get things are going to get worse before they get better. But very soon, these vaccines are going to start being deployed, and I think that we may well get the situation. There's also some single dose vaccines coming along. Johnson and Johnson's, for example, is single dose. I'm not supposed to be advertising anything. I'm not. But I mean, Merck also got a single dose vaccine. These haven't been tested yet, but um, they they might. And that would again enormously increase the practicability of global vaccination programs. You know, finding somebody once, but having to find them a second time, a certain fixed period after, and identify exactly who they are. Um, this is much more difficult whereas a single shot vaccine that's sort of affordable and can be taken around in refrigerators rather than, you know, minus 70 freezers. It, I think this may, we, we, we may well be in that position by 
sometime in the spring or late spring. So I think I think that you know we're going to have a fair number, and also, and also anyway, just, and just it, who knew that vaccines were going to be this good? Nobody. It just wasn't known. There were various theories based on the low rates in Southeast Asia and Southwest China and so on. It was because the coronavirus was were protecting them, but there's nothing like a good randomized trial. In two five two cases versus thirteen cases, that beautiful, just beautiful. I'm curious, how do you think the anti-vax movement might influence the well vaccination of the general population? Well, if you think about it, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say this, of course, but um, given the narrowness of um, of Biden's majority, it may well be that it was the anti-vaccination movement and the higher death rates um, caused by Republicans refusing to um, take precautions that just got Biden elected. You never know. You had about 200,000 Americans killed by it. Actually, there's a serious answer. I think it's it's going to be a major problem. What's going to happen is there's going to be, you know, if you get widespread vaccination, if, we've, if you vaccinate hundreds of millions of people, if you vaccinate billions of people, many people are going to just get some illness straight after the vaccination. Nothing, nothing to do with the vaccination. That anecdote is going to get told. The people concerned, close to the person who's had this thing happen, will be certain it was a cause and effect thing, the way humans are. And then it'll get posted and amplified and these will be true stories. There will be many, many anecdotes that are true of people being vaccinated and something dreadful happening to them shortly afterwards. And I think this is going to get amplified. I mean, if you look what's been possible with MMR, with zero evidence that there's anything true, well, you know, we're going to get a lot of people who get events happening after vaccination and are not caused by vaccination within a week of vaccination. And this, you're going to have to be very careful how these are managed how to actually try to limit the misinformation because the, the efforts of deliberate misinformation will be substantial and they'll work. And I, I don't know what, I don't know, I think it will be, I mean, overall vaccination is winning worldwide, but the anti-vaccination people have done a lot of damage to public health, particularly in places like Ukraine, where, you know, sort of paranoid theories went rampant and they got a really serious measles epidemic and a lot of deaths. I guess it's also, you know, I, I, I've spoken to people who usually wouldn't be in the anti-vax movement at all, and they are so shocked by how quickly the vaccine has been developed that instead of seeing it as a kind of scientific feat, they see it as, as a fake vaccine. And then also people have been stuck at home with nothing better to do than surf the internet and, and read all of these theories, so... Yeah, they've got these things called the Darwin Awards, haven't they? I mean, you're, yeah, you're yeah. sort of evolutionary medicine. Um, they've got the Darwin Awards for, you know, the one selective thing left is the person who dies in the most stupid possible way. And, you know, you could actually put some of these at the Darwin Awards and you, as working in the Department of Evolutionary Medicine, surely are best placed to nominate people for the Darwin Awards. So I think, you know, somebody who really doesn't believe that when you do a randomised trial with and get 252 cases versus 13 cases, it actually means something. I think they'd really, they'd really qualify very well for Darwin Awards. I totally agree. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not a bad shout. Um, I have one more on COVID and then I'll move to the other questions. Um, is there any data on how lockdowns have changed smoking habits and wh well, whether they have, I suppose? No, I don't know. Um, I think that one thing that isn't true is the early claims that smoking protects against COVID. Claims were made, and this was just based on, on unreliable data to start with. I mean, what happens is, you know, people, people initially in China and in France, just, you know, when you've got the patient in front of you with COVID, you're treating them desperately. You don't know if they're going to die. You don't know if they're going to infect you and you're going to die. It's just a horrible situation. You've got more of them queuing up in the corridor outside or stretched out outside. You know, the last thing you're going to do is write down in their notes whether they were a smoker or not. And so, you know, in France, they finish up with only about 3% of the COVID patients having smoker written down in their notes. So somebody went to the notes and said, oh, my God, look, there's very low prevalence of smoking among COVID patients. This must be because nicotine is protective. And the same thing got done in China as well, just in Wuhan. And, and so the, the, this started the thing. And then there have been various other studies. I think you've got to be quite careful in how you do your research on this. Otherwise, you finish up with reverse causality. I mean, you know, also, I mean, there's, you know, they used to sell these buttons saying cancer cures smoking, but probably the same is true of COVID. And, you know, so you, you're going to get disease actually preventing smoking and also other diseases that predispose to COVID, you know, general morbidity predisposes to COVID, but also can stop you smoking. So you've got to be quite careful about what's caused and what's effect. The person who's done that best is Valerie Burrell. 
And she really concludes that actually there is an excess, of COVID, excess risk of COVID in smokers, not, as was rumoured six months ago, a reduction in risk of COVID. is the actual reverse of the truth. And what COVID's done to smoking, I've got really no idea. I'm sorry, I just don't have any information. No, that's no problem. Actually, I'm Paula... Stop asking questions about COVID. Ask about something else. Go on. <laughs> um, so um, how much personal mortality can be mitigated at the individual level for those who quit smoking? Not a lot in rich countries, not a lot. Um, it, we, we, we keep on talking about prevention, cancer prevention, etc. But actually, if you add up all of the preventive things that we know, every single one of them add up their effects, then they don't add up to as much in total, all the reliably known effects there are, as smoking does in this population. Obviously, if you're a smoker, it's even far more true. So we... we there are places in the world where things really matter. I mean, hepatitis B vaccination really matters. You vaccinate kids, they don't get hepatitis B, they don't die from the cancer in middle age. Human papillomavirus vaccination really matters. You know, vaccinate against HPV and women won't, finish, won't get cervix cancer. So that there are things you can do, and there's there are some minor things. I mean, for example, menopausal hormone treatment does somewhat increase the risk of developing breast cancer, but not very much. Um, and so I, th I think much, much less than you would think to hear everybody talking about cancer prevention. And I think don't get, don't smoke, don't get too fat and um, mostly enjoy life, I think. I think the, the one that I didn't go into, um, which is a much longer story, is that of air pollution. Um, my opinion is, I mean, I've tried to review, over the last year, I've been trying to review all of the major studies on air pollution. And I think that these are dominated by artifact. I think that the claim that the real effects are probably um, less than a tenth, they're order of magnitude different from reality. There's an order of magnitude difference between reality and um, the claimed effects of air pollution. So I think that, uh, you know, and people say, oh, well, it can't be good for you. Well, I'm not saying whether it's good for you. I'm trying to say that we, I want to be quantitative. How much would one actually gain by getting rid of all air pollution from vehicles or all air pollution from various other things? I mean, you know, global warming's real. That's, that's clearly real. But are the health hazards from ambient air pollution, from the air pollution in the outside air, are these anything like they're claimed to be? And I... My opinion is that they're not. I think that it's. I think it's been a succession of epidemiological mistakes have led to this belief that this is a major cause of death. Um, and it, I mean, there is, for example, in the US, you start looking at the most polluted counties and the least polluted counties, and you find, well, you know, you've got more than twenty-five percent black population in the um, more polluted counties, and let fewer than five percent in less polluted counties well this is a marker of various other social differences and you can adjust for them to some extent but when you adjust for things instead of in epidemiology you nearly always under adjust and so i think that we are under adjusting for um for the social difference for the social differences between the polluted and the unpolluted areas that's that's my view of the evidence as i've reviewed it so far i want to continue reviewing it um in collaboration with others at oxford but I think, and I, I think the same is true of many of the dietary factors that are said to be very importantly relevant, you know, vegetables and fruits and um, meats and this and the other thing. I mean, yeah, don't get fat. I mean, just don't, don't, don't finish up getting obese. Obesity causes diabetes, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia. That's real. But how much the specific dietary factors are relevant? Again, I think, I think that the epidemiology has been done really wrongly and that the claims by the global burden of disease program for example that dietary factors simple dietary factors that one can manipulate just by sort of changing diet following dietary guidelines they're responsible for something like 10 million deaths a year worldwide again i think these are wrong by a factor of well probably well over a factor of 10 but they're, they're certainly wrong order of magnitude anyway i think these risks are actually so small they're almost unmeasurably small when the epidemiology is done properly I concentrated on the things that were real rather than concentrating on the things that weren't real. And the same is true of, you know, many environmental chemicals, environmental, etc. You know, I think there's so many 
I mean, when you read the newspapers, there seems to be one cause of cancer after another, after another, after another. And you think probably all these causes of cancer is a lucky man and get out of this world alive. But it's, <coughs> I think most of it's of either zero importance or relatively little importance. So unfortunately, we know much less than we thought we did. We know a few things that are really big and important and want to take them seriously. As I said at the end, you can avoid more deaths by a moderate reduction in a big cause than by a big reduction in a small cause or a big reduction in a non-existent cause. Thank you very much. A long uh, debate. <laughs> if, if people wanted to argue back, and but I could argue back to them if they did argue back. If, if, they now it's being mediated through you, so I'm safe. Uh, well, well, if anyone has a response, you're very welcome to write it in the chat and I can read it out, no problem. So you don't quite get to escape the debate if it starts up. Um, but I'll move on to the next question, which is a question by Doug Rover. Um, if treatments for non-communicable diseases are simple and cheap, why are deaths not already lower? Well, they are already lower, as I showed. I mean, we come down from what was 16% dying in middle age from vascular disease back in 1980 down to 4% in 2010. I mean, that's, that's, a fairly, that's quite a nice reduction. Um, and in many countries, the same is true. Um, so I think, I think we do need to take more seriously compliance with these treatments. I mean, if you, if you look in, especially places like China and India, I mean, China, there's plenty of medical diagnosis of occlusive stroke or heart disease, but why are generics 10 times more expensive in China than they are in India. And it's because of the economic hospital structure that basically the hospitals get their support by prescribing drugs that the patients pay for. So it's a perverse incentive not to prescribe low cost things. And the doctors within the hospitals are gonna get their salary from the hospital, partly in relation to what they prescribe. And so you've got this perverse incentive to prescribe patented things rather than generic things. And when the generics do come, I don't know what the mechanism is, they finish up being much higher cost than they could be. I mean, India's got quite, quite good generic stuff. I don't, I don't know what the usage patterns are there, but when you do surveys of people with a history of stroke and heart disease in China, far too few of them are on maintenance treatment with things that would protect them from recurrence. And even in this country, you, know, you get the sort of anti-statin propaganda, um, and it's really is quite extraordinary if you go onto the internet and you look at the vituperativeness of the anti-statin, of the anti-statin stuff that goes up there. It's just like hatred of, uh, of the people who have actually got these, developed these drugs and are now, which are now generic, available as, as low cost generics. It's, 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 it's extraordinary how full of hatred such things can be. And when you read it, you know, it, it's enough to put anybody off taking them. So uh, I think if, I think one thing about drugs, and it, this, this again comes back to whether anti-vax stuff, we're going to finish up with that very strongly in terms of vaccines, I'm afraid. You know, anecdotes are going to get amplified rather than getting systematic evidence. Um, and I, th I think, I don't know, I, just, I, just, I mean, I think things are going to go wrong in that respect. But I think a lot of people will get vaccinated and maybe that will be enough to produce herd immunity and protect the unvaccinated ones. But I think on the, on, on the, the vascular medication, I think the stories of side effects. And you know, whenever, any, whenever anybody takes a pill, if anything happens, then they're gonna put it down to the pill they're taking. And it's, it's just extraordinary the extent to which people will infer cause and effect. And you can do it, but you can do both ways around, you know, take vitamin pills and think they're producing eternal life when actually the randomized evidence says they don't do much dif make much difference. Or you can take drugs that work and think they've got all kinds of side effects that the placebo controlled evidence shows they don't have. For example, um, tamoxifen is a treatment for women with breast cancer. It was the earliest, uh, it was the first of the really effective endocrine treatments. There's good placebo controlled evidence that shows that it doesn't cause weight gain. And yet its list, weight gain is listed as a possible side effect of tamoxifen. And many women stopped tamoxifen because it caused weight gain. They say, well, you know, middle-aged women do gain weight they're going to attribute it to something like the tamoxifen, so you can get discontinuation of drugs that really save lives in response to non-existent side effects. There we do know that it doesn't cause weight gain because we've got placebo-controlled evidence. And the same with statins, we know that most of the um, muscle pain that is um, reported by people taking statins, you get, this, you get very much the same levels of reporting among the people who are allocated placebo in the placebo-controlled trials of statins. And yet, 
since side effects of statins are a reason why something like a quarter of patients put onto them will discontinue them. I mean, human brains aren't very good at sorting out causality. You need placebo-controlled randomized evidence for some things. And that's certainly true of antidepressants. I mean, sometimes they may, sometimes the randomized evidence is just beautiful. I remember when I, I used to think antidepressants were just medicine for the worried well, and then we went and reviewed all the randomized trials of antidepressants. And God, I mean, you, you put them all together, it was about a 10 standard error difference. There was, you know, the probability of a major depressive episode was about 50% in the people who got given dummy pills, and it was about 25% in those who had allocated real antidepressants. And since depressed people often don't do what they're told, if they actually done what they're told, it would be an even bigger protective effect. And at least got me stopping thinking that um, it was just medicine for the worried well, it isn't. It's, it, it actually works for some patients. And also, seriously, it doesn't suit some other patients. I and mean, actually, some people will find themselves actually disturbed by what's supposed to be antidepressants. But, you know, they, they certainly do work well for some people. Anyway, Thank you. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And we I'm really stopping now because I don't actually know anything else. <laughs> That's it for our questions. Um, and we look forward to seeing uh, the research that you're, you're looking at now. Um, coming out soon, I guess, or whenever. Yeah, well, December the 2nd, you're in the Journal of Medicine. Because it's just showing that um, several fairly useless drugs for COVID are fairly useless. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. I will share that around. Thank you very much for joining us. And everybody else, you can join us next week where we will be hearing from Professor Jonathan Wells. And we'll see you next